Lost Signals present Countdown to Justice, where we pit Batman versus Superman. Seven rounds, seven episodes examining five decades of these two iconic superheroes represented on celluloid. In anticipation for the upcoming Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. Which superheroes film series will emerge victorious? Stay tuned and find out. Good evening. Welcome to Countdown of Countdown to Justice, round six. Tonight we have The Dark Knight, directed by Christopher Nolan, versus Man of Steel, directed by Zack Snyder. And my name is Luis Duran. I'm with my co-host, Richard Perry. Woo! And Chris Morgan. Hello. So, we, uh, we're kind of winding down on this. So I want to get first impressions on, uh, I guess, arguably, well, I, probably the best Batman <coughs> film of all time against a reboot and actually what presents us to the new timeline in the DC Universe, Man of Steel. Uh, nothing really specific. Anything you guys want to lead off on? I think the, probably the best thing is to kind of... It's, it's kind of hard to compare these two movies because um, The Dark Knight is the second in a trilogy. You know, mm. The first mm. movie was about establishing Batman. And we met the um, we met uh, Crane, you know the Scarecrow, Ra's al Ghul, and uh, Falcone, and you know that was basically centered on him. And the Dark Knight is really centered on not being an origin story, being like a Batman story. You've got equal times Batman, you know, slash Bruce Wayne. They have time working on um, the Joker, who the Joker is. Um, in addition to Harvey Dent, his relationship to uh, Rachel Dawes, it was featured in the last movie, and how Harvey Dent came to be. So it really does kind of work like a, a bigger graphic novel where you, you keep switching back. It's not so center focused because it doesn't have to be. We've already established Batman. And in Man of Steel, you've got to, you have to, you have to establish um, Superman, but at the time, they hadn't really thought as far ahead with regard to um, the Justice League, but they did, you know, obviously set up that it was a shared universe because there's a Lex Corp uh, truck and uh, Wayne Industry satel uh, satellite. And apparently, Louis, you said that there's an open uh, chamber on the ship. Yeah, that open pod. Could with, be. I'm pretty sure it's uh, confirmed that it's Supergirl's pod. So she emerges prior to eighteen thousand years prior, apparently. I mean, I, I, not sure what the timeline is, but I know there's a comic out there. But it's regardless, that's still pretty, pretty interesting to do. To, well, as soon as they're creating the universe, they just kind of started peppering things here and there to develop later on. Yeah, planting the seeds. Yeah. But so it's it's kind of like you've got two it's kind of like you got two different approaches to the movies because it was is this one I'm you know starting off it's kind of it feels like it's a little more difficult and I think I don't know for me for me when it comes to the Nolan trilogy whatever movie I'm watching is my favorite Batman film because there's I think each one of them has their own unique strengths their own unique styles so uh, compare so comparing The Dark Knight to the other Batman films, I can't really do. But if we're going to do as a film versus as a film, these two films. I'm kind of actually just trying to talk through how we're going to approach this one. <laughs> it was much easier when we were yeah. dealing with, with uh, Burton. Because yeah, like, you, had, uh, you had Batman's origin, juxtaposed with Superman's origin, and then like each, one, each sequel could be put against each other. Yeah, we, we really did. Yeah, exactly. Origin movie versus origin movie, sequel versus sequel, each getting more ridiculous. In Batman's case, Batman becoming a better person and Superman <laughs> becoming yeah, a worse person. person. So um, kinda, I guess it did culminate with uh, Superman Returns. <laughs> it's like an absentee father in that one. Yeah, yeah, this one definitely brought it back to uh, him being the you know, the golden boy. Doesn't do anything wrong. Probably doesn't well, except curse. for being a peeping Tom. Oh yeah, the, the last not, not Man of Steel. <laughs> I said Man of Steel, like oh, it's the, yeah. Man of Steel. Yeah, so they kind of he made it clear he was like yeah, Man of Steel. He's just got some. He's, he's got a few anger issues. Yeah, but who doesn't? 
I mean, at least he like put it put his anger on inanimate objects, like that guy's truck. Yeah, I mean, the problem is, I feel like, I feel like I understand you you have to have Henry Cavill in for X amount of scenes, but and there are certain scenes where I feel, wish that they hadn't tried to young him, like they already had like a teenage uh, Clark, and for certain scenes I wish they'd used him instead of Henry Cavill mm. because having a teenage tantrum in a car you know with your dad when you look like you're in your 20s <laughs> when you're saying you're not my real dad and what my real dad just kind of loses its punch it's like you've never had this argument before all yeah. this time you've you've known for 10 years you're an alien and you know he's been yeah he's been holding on to that one for a while <laughs> <laughs> yeah seriously seriously it's it's like, a, gonna get him I don't know what kind of, what argument this is going to pop in. <laughs> Just going to throw know. that one in there, <laughs> as always. Uh, I mean, it's it's one that, for me, when I first saw Man of Steel, I was kind of shocked to hear after a lot of people were very disappointed in it. Yeah, And I was trying to figure me. out why. Because for me, Man of Steel is honestly a Superman movie, 100%. They rarely call him Clark. You hear Cal as his, one of his first names. And it was not until the end you actually see Clark Kent. Like, the one that's actually trying to blend in, the, has to fake being a real person. Um, you know, first 33 years of his life, we come to find out. Yeah. Which is a lo- um, one of many references to Jesus. Drugs. Which is, uh, I don't know if it's a callback to the Donner film, or even later on in some of the later Superman films. Or, it just could be a reoccurring theme. It's kind of been in the kind of it's coming through in the comics as well but this one is definitely a superman movie and it was everything that i expected and i loved it but identity was a huge thing which i think that's why they put in so much with memories and him trying to find a place yeah i actually appreciate that they kept clark to the end because uh i think it'd be way too many people trying to compare his uh his portrayal to christopher reeves and I think they kind of sidestepped that by keeping that in like the last, what, 15 seconds of the movie? Yeah. yeah. This movie, I, I, I've seen this movie three times. I saw it in the theater um, opening day at 9 in the morning. And, uh, well, you know. Um, and, I, and then I saw it on the following week with my buddy. And then I watched it again tonight. And it's been about three years since I saw it, I think. And each time, I've actually liked the film less, but it's not because... How do I say this? They had all the right elements there. I mean, I really appreciate it. I, I actually really wish they'd gone farther and spent like a half an hour on Krypton because it felt like in the Donner film, there was a lot to say, but they kind of just cut it down to the basics. There wasn't a lot of exposition. Mm-hmm. And... um you know, so you know, so you got a good sense. You got enough of a sense through the dialogue in the ten minute, fifteen minutes we're in Krypton as to what was going on. This one was truer to what I understand the comics were, and like you know, in some of my research where after it came out, finding out that Zod and Thea and Ursa, those were his two colleagues, that they were actually on Drell's side, that Drell and um, and um, Zod were friends. And they just had two different ways of going about when they found that Krypton was in, was in, was in jeopardy. Because correct me if I'm wrong, because um, I only just started reading Superman a couple years ago. I never really... He was just too perfect of a character. I mean, you can only destroy him with, like, certain things. You know, he, you yeah, know yeah. and it wasn't until um, they started humanizing him, you know, as we said in the Donner film, where you find out that his... That compassion is part of one of his... No weaknesses, but it's he does have compassion in that, and he is very trusting. And those are things that can be used against him, mm. like Gene Hackman mm. did, how he tricked Superman into walking into the Kryptonite, you know, finding the Kryptonite. Um, and I, I think they really needed to go a little farther on Krypton, that they really should have slowed it down a little bit, and instead of like giving us even more information in like less time. That they should have like said, okay, we, we want to build up these relationships. We want to, you know, kick off the movie instead of Clark's birth or Kellel's birth. Kick it off with the, you know, kick it off with um, um, 
Zod's revolution and having him have him get caught and then at the trial you know have the trial like at the beginning of of the Donner film and then you can kind of go over his how we got to that point and then you know that'll bring in the council and everybody's arguments you can you can tell a lot in scenes rather than 40 minutes in, later into the movie having like exposition scene after exposition scene after exposition yeah. scene I uh, to me it got ridiculous to the point where it's like we could form a singularity you meet a black hole it's just like terraforming what's terraforming I mean it's just like I mean there's it's it, to me it could have been you know I think all as I said all the elements were there I just don't think they were in my opinion put together correctly yeah definitely I mean then again my version of the movie would probably be a lot more boring because I, I know that Mark Millar wrote a treatment for a trilogy and most of the first half was going to be on Krypton and Superman wasn't going to show up until the end of the first movie. I oh, mean, wow. Yeah, it was going to be Jeez, about... That's ballsy. Yeah, and, but I'm kind of like in that thought, like if you spent a half hour on Krypton and then like a half hour on his childhood, if you're going to... Because they had a lot of really great stuff in here. There's just certain things, like Kent's death, like Pa Kent's death, I hated that way they did it in this yeah. movie. Mm-hmm. It was it's like... It, just, I don't think he would have just stood there and watched that happen. Plus the fact that like that Jonathan felt it was necessary <laughs> to go back to the car instead of Clark. It's like here, take this child that I'm already carrying and go make sure your mother is over there underneath the over the underpass where she's at. Well, it was also such bullshit because Martha hops out of the car, the dog's next to her, closes the door the behind door. her, and the dog's right there. I mean, like, Jesus Christ, just open the you know, when you jump out of the car take the dog with you yeah she's terrible she was a terrible owner that's what did that's what did Paul Cannon in <laughs> what she was a terrible dog owner <laughs> <laughs> yeah like spoiler on uh, Avengers Age of Ultron like bad parenting got yes. I can't believe it's not Quicksilver too. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, bad dog ownership got her you know makes one a widow in this one it's like she lost her kid three times in that fucking movie <laughs> <laughs> So they were setting it up. Just like, see? See? (laughs) This is going to be the end of all of us. But the whole thing is, the stuff that I really wanted to see more of was not like him with the whole bus bullshit. I I love the scene where he, when all the senses start kicking in, he's got the x-ray. Yeah. Yeah. And Ma Kent has to go and pull him out of the closet. And then later on where, um, you know, Jonathan... I wish they'd found another way because I don't think you need this sensationalism because more and more people are going to be able to put this shit together. The so, one, the one thing I liked about the saving the kid was that that he saved the bully. I liked the the one bully. What was his name? Pete Ross. Pete Ross. I like the fact that he would be one of the people who knew Superman's identity. So yeah. if you had mm-hmm. something a little more subtle than the bus accident where you had like two hundred bystanders. Maybe something with just Pete, like, you know, Pete's chasing him down on the bikes and, you know, Pete falls in the river and Clark has to save him. Yeah. Something like that. Tone it down a little or bit. Or even if they didn't want to keep it subtle, just like go to whole nine and like take it to the next level where he saves his father from the tornado and then the town just kind of keeps a secret. Yeah. 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 Make it. Yeah. That'd be a totally great way to make it their own narrative and just be totally different. Because not many people do really know his identity in the comics or anything. Mm-hmm. They've retconned that many times, if they do. <laughs> but it's 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 funny. Chris mentioned it that they had so many opportunities to make such a make a better film. I mean, I know I said I'm kind of contradicting myself, but it, there are always opportunities to make a better one. Because compared to Dark Knight, even though when it set itself up for jokes and humor, it did it with style and flair. And when it did the exposition, it kind of it, it allowed the the actors to kind of play around with it. I mean, the mm-hmm. one thing is with the sonar device. I know I said outside when they oh, yeah. were in Tokyo. <laughs> oh, no, it was in China. Hong Kong. In Hong Kong. Oh, yeah. And he just says, it, like, it's a, it's so, using sonar. Oh, it's just like like a submarine, Mr. Wayne. He's <laughs> <laughs> always wants to say bad. He's like, but like a submarine, Mr. Wayne. <laughs> Like that, like it's 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 so clever, and I didn't know. I usually don't notice things like that, but I was paying close attention this time, and I was like, 
of course. Like it flew over my head, and now I'm starting to get it. And there are even other instances too, you know, especially with Joker. That he, the actors had so much good material. It, I find it strange. Did, didn't Goyer and Nolan also write Dark Knight? Yeah, but the the thing is, um, I don't really know how much involvement Christopher Nolan had in because I know a lot of people are like saying, "Oh, we've got this bleak, joyless." Super Age of Superhero started by Nolan. I'm like, no. If you watch the Batman films, as you just point out, the jokes work. There is a lighthearted yeah. start. These people are human. There's dimensional. There's, there, there. You know, there's sad times, and there's the jokes work when it's ha- funny, and then it can be serious. And in this one, you know, it was very, very dry. And I did notice this thing about David Goyer looking back on his tenure. Um, he seems to be a multiplying factor because like if you put him because with the Batman movies he and Christopher Nolan or he Jonathan Nolan and Christopher Nolan wrote the stories but it was Christopher and Jonathan that wrote the scripts for the for those movies hmm. Goyer just helped with the story in this one I know this was the opposite that Nolan threw in the um, um, Nolan got credit for story but didn't get credit for screenplay and I heard that Goyer even had to sell both Zack Snyder and Christopher Nolan on uh, Superman Killing Zod at the end that was his idea Mm. well yeah that's I was pleased with that I mean that's the that's pretty much the only logical conclusion to their fight plus as we saw in the Donner movie, he's done yeah, it before. He's done it before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I think it was even more fucked up because he depowered them and then threw them off a fucking cliff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Didn't even offer it. Like he could have just sent him to it. jail. He played with his uh, with being before killing it. I mean, my problem with isn't him killing Zod. It's the fact that uh, I, wrote, I noticed this during the movie that I, I think what happened is after they destroyed um, all the and, and kudos to this movie for like you know having product placement and then having your heroes and villains wipe out your product placement. Mm. Sears, IHOP, 7-Eleven, they all got destroyed. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, But I I think it would have been more effective if um, at the end, uh, after they destroyed um, Smallville, that Superman's just like, well, you you really have to keep civilians away from this. Have the two world terraformers uh, not one of them not be in metropolis yeah. and then after superman sends everybody else in the phantom zone zod says fuck you and goes on a rampage in metropolis and then the the scene where superman like basically grabs him tries to get him out of the city have that and then if there's any damage on the way out or whatever it's minimalized. You know, you haven't already destroyed the center of Metropolis. Yeah, we were, we were saying there was no reason for him to, have, like, put that world engine in Metropolis. Yeah. Like, had had he even been there before? Had Clark ever been in Metropolis before? No. Yeah, Nobody so there was, had. like, yeah. So there was, I don't know, just plot, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because of plot. It would have worked much better as if, um, you know, because... Zod would have known, you know, that he had a thing for Lois and that Lois maybe was in Metropolis. So Zod could be like, hey, fuck you. I'm going to Metropolis. You yeah. know, and destroy that and I'm going to go get your girlfriend. Which, by the way, since we were writing the movie, I liked your idea about, like, Smallville keeping the secret and him actually saving Jonathan. Because that would be a nice subversion of expectation. You think Jonathan's going to die there. Yeah. He doesn't. And then the town, you know, basically agrees to keep silent. And then... Later on, after he's returned home, you know, he's with Jonathan or something, and they've, rec- you know, reconciled or whatever, and then he, he, uh, he has an aneurysm, or yeah, he dies yes, yes, off screen, so, yeah. someplace where Clark can't help him, but had he been there, or... Because that's what, that's, that's what a lot, I think that's a big part of what that heart attack meant, because it was something that Clark could not save him from. Yeah. It's like, this one, he just, like he said, I allowed my father to die. Yeah. Because I trusted him with the decision to keep my secret. Yeah, and, and I, I like it's much better. I noticed in the Donner film, subtlety works so much better. Because all, you know, all those powers I have, and I couldn't save him, says so much more mm-hmm. than you know all these other stuff, all this other stuff. 
I was like, I've been afraid of the government all my life. That's why I didn't <laughs> say my father. <laughs> My father was an anti government. His dad is more like an anti government militia guy. Yeah. So, Jonathan Kent was an interesting character in this movie. Like, just. If you if you just take his lines the wrong way, especially the one about whether or not he should have saved the kids. Oh, yeah. yeah. Seriously. He doesn't, sound, he doesn't give an answer, but he was just probably thinking, yeah. He's just, like, I don't know. Maybe. Yes, I want to yeah. protect you, so and I'm willing to let like <laughs> half your class die to save you to protect you. I'll sacrifice anyone to keep you out of their hands. <laughs> <laughs> we can't have the government getting a hold of your powers. Do you know what they'll do? <laughs> no, it's like they'll they'll overlook all the childhood deaths. That's fine. <laughs> that won't raise any questions at all. Clark was the only one who survived. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how that happened. It just keeps happening that way. <laughs> All these accidents. <laughs> All these fights where the bullies just come home and stretchers. The dislocated jaws. God, there'd be like, his class reunion would just be a whole bunch of empty seats. <laughs> memorials and like cripples. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so it's. Uh, I, I thought all the elements were there. I agree with you. I like the fact that Clark Kent didn't show up to the end. I also like the fact, and as I said, I like the fact that people would know Clark's identity. I like the fact that Lois, you know, to take always a different knew. route. Yeah, yeah, always knew. Found yeah, real quick. yeah. I, love, I love that so much about her, her character this time around. How she took the initiative and like made her way all the way back to Smallville. Yeah, <laughs> just in time to see him at his father's grave. But I mean, but then there's stupid things like <laughs> she runs out of the cop car, and he's yeah. the Superman going Clark, Clark. He's like in yeah. full. Yeah. It, and Clark later says I'm from Kansas. I'm like, no, everybody can put that together. So I mean, if it's Kansas, a, huh? <laughs> if, it's small, if it's a small bill, it's a small town keeping a secret, or you have Lois and Pete whatever his name is and Martha having certain people agree to hide who Superman is that works for me I noticed they didn't really I use, like that they didn't really use uh, Lana too much this time around mm, yeah. Lana was just yeah she was a, just kind of mentioned her offhand and I'm, I'm assuming the girl that was yeah watching him that whole time was her girl in bus yeah girl in bus pretty much I love the grittiness though I would say a man of steel and so many people like so such violence and everything like you actually see casualties and like just they yeah, don't they don't hide it they don't yeah. try to make it instead innocent of gloss, or instead of glossing over it yeah I, I, see but that's that's the problem though is I don't I mean all this destruction everything that's happened and you know and I'm going to agree on some of the critics on this film I don't mean professional critics I mean criticisms is that after all these people all these th you know, all these people being lost, you know, that all of a sudden four people are, of course, to Superman, every life is supposed to be sacred, but to the audience, you know, after all this destruction and, you know, because I'm going to be, I've never liked the third act of this movie at all. And it's just too much action. I mean, and I'm one of these people who loved Mad Max Fury Road, because to me, that was an action film where the actions told a story. Yeah. And it was all practical, and it was like a ballet. And this was just like a lot of CGI and a lot of green screen and a lot of stuff being knocked down. So by the time we it's got like a to Michael Bay wet dream, yeah. So by the it would have been much more powerful if there was less damage, and him going to Metropolis was more personal. Then when you have four people that Zod's about to kill just to say fuck you because I can't get to Lois, I can't get with, well, you know, get destroy the city before. You know, I you know Zod knowing that maybe he's about to die, but he's going to take four of these people with him. Yeah, that would be even be more of a reason for that fight to happen in Smallville too. Yeah, yeah. this is like, oh, I'll while destroy you're your home yeah, while you're staying here, saving her. I'll go destroy your home and your mother. Yeah, there's a couple of different ways they could have approached that. So I agree, I, I'm okay, but I just don't think the killing, all the people that died was. I didn't really see the remorse. It was, en it was enough seeing the world engines do it. But then yeah. for them to continue on the half of the city that wasn't destroyed? Yeah. <laughs> <Here's> <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like when he's like... Because for the first half of that fight between him and Zod, it was just him kind of reacting to the shots. Yeah. And just trying to take him out. And then when he starts using the buildings to 
like, you air quotes hurt him like when he's dragging his face along the side of the building he's yeah. cutting it in half I'm like Clark really really yeah exactly oh dude you gotta be smarter than this oh man I am gonna say this and, the, and one of the things uh, the thing I loved about seeing it tonight was for a couple different reasons I actually got to look back after reflecting on this movie for a couple years and really just appreciate everything that did, they did right and really for the first time firm an opinion on this movie and secondly um the for about a minute into the movie the first time we saw it, <laughs> beth and i looked at each other and we're like we're buying the soundtrack i mean hans zimmer's soundtrack is amazing and knowing it now and actually listening to it the the soundtrack in context of the movie tells such a story in and of itself like i that to me the way the the music was used in this movie was for any other fault it may have was beautiful I mean, and that's not just to Hans Zimmer. It was, you know, to Zack Snyder and to the editor and so forth. You know, I mean, Hans mm. Zimmer, yeah, definitely. But the music was done, worked really, really well in the context of this movie. Yeah, I always trust his his ear and ability to create a great sound. I mean, the Dark Knight out uh, soundtrack also is is amazing. Just right. paying attention all the, the different nuances with the how the music changes with who, what character is being shown the the placing of when it's you know action sequences and everything the climax sequences and it, it, it was just the drums are always what gets me on this on yeah the Dark Knight trilogy soundtracks yeah well you know the the Joker theme that mm -hmm. that happens mm -hmm. at the beginning Christopher Nolan when he's flying you know, from wherever to Hong Kong to shoot the Hong Kong scenes. Um, basically, <laughs> Hot Zipper gave him, like, sent him a, a file with, like, you know, 200 different things for the Joker. So basically, no one was saying, like, on the way, on the way to Hong Kong, he was listening to, like, 400, ver you know, a couple hundred or whatever different versions of that. E I could, <laughs> I'm surprised he just. <laughs> Just punches out the next person he sees as soon as he steps off the plane. No one, Welcome to Hong Kong. Ugh. No one goes in the bathroom, comes out, has cuts up his uh, <laughs> We know how I got these scars. <laughs> it's not Zimmer's fault. <laughs> no, Aunt Zimmer's great. He, he, he really is. Yeah, and I have to, before we even think about moving on to the Dark Knight, I have to bring up how Feyor is like my favorite character in this movie. Yeah, she's really she just wrecks evil. everyone. <laughs> she was great, especially that so. small relationship she she builds with the uh, the one uh, is it general, I guess. Or yeah, it, it's just or colonel, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the colonel. Is that the German mad scientist from um, from Krypton? Who? Who is the Who is the one the one that was performing the experiments on him? With the the one Kryptonian with the German accent. Yeah, I don't oh, remember, yes. I don't remember his medical. name. Yes, even on Krypton. Yeah, the accents in Krypton. <laughs> on Krypton, of course, as a German scientist. <laughs> I, wonder, uh, I wonder why they like it. Why? Why the need to do that? Why? Why? Well, maybe, unless maybe it's just the actor and he just has the accent, and now we're just adding value to it. <laughs> Poor no, guy. What? We're just what? picking on his accent. Well, well, they were going that route with the stereotypes. Should have taken a step further. Just had, like... <laughs> like, a 10-foot dude just be, like, an, like, a basketball player or something. Like that. <laughs> All just right, have, him, have him look like Suge Knight. <laughs> that was good. I was wondering where you're going with that one. Although one thing I did notice, they both these movies they continue the pattern of killing. That's for sure. Yeah. Because they say Batman unintentionally. Well, it's always unintentional. In the pretty much in the Nolan, like he doesn't save him, but he doesn't. He kind of causes her death with Harvey Dent. I guess he pushed him off that ledge, and he ended up dying. I couldn't grab his hand. Well, <laughs> that that yeah, the deaths in the Dark Knight. We're gonna and 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 Bruce and. The Joker's plan. I, 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 I've actually been. I actually gave that a lot of thought. So, when we get there, you know, remind me to. Because the death counts were were high, but they were completely. 
I, all I'm gonna say is I, I feel like in the Dark Knight the 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 deaths had more point mm. as opposed to no oh, yeah absolutely what the <laughs> burden <laughs> films as opposed, <laughs> as opposed to what the burden films. Just one time no. killing spree. Uh, uh, well, the yeah, Burton films, yeah, but I was also talking oh, about like about the... when we were talking. We just said about the killings that there's a lot of death. Oh, in you there. mean the, uh, the instead of the civilian deaths with everybody dying? It was or... like collateral damage as opposed Especially to like, as opposed to murder as like a tactic. I, I mm. did not remember how mu- how many kills the army was responsible for in this movie. <laughs> Who was it? Oh, when they're launching the ships, yeah. or the not ships, the missiles not even, and like, everything. Before that, even in Smallville, when they're like coming at them with the uh, oh yeah, the lethal fire, like they ju- like <laughs> Superman just got the people into the buildings. It's like be like stay safe, stay inside, and then all the buildings get blown up. Is it yeah? And what was it? Fea? Feora. Feora, yeah. She deflects that one missile and like you know blows up the you know didn't destroy everything, but you know. Made a crater, so made a crater. <laughs> destroyed the uh, the planes, and they end up crashing into the into the town as well. Just everything just rains fire on that town, <laughs> the poor town. And the and the engine, the train engine that was put through Sears. Yeah, no, oh, I mean, so, somebody's got to put two and two together at this point. Seriously, it's like Metropolis, Smallville. Like only Who's two, c- c- only yeah. two cities. Only two cities that got destroyed. The whole thing. Who do we know? And the Indian yeah, I used Ocean. to live in Kansas. <laughs> Even the other terraform thing was like in the middle of the ocean. Like, there's nothing, nobody living there, maybe one fisher. Yeah. And that's just about it. Like, that's all they show. There's in just no in civilization. I guarantee you that's where his kingdom is. Yeah. Or, or that'd be crazy. Like, just like sitting there. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> just, just dragged up. I, again, when I found out that you know, because apparently that's one of that's that's part of like uh, Aquaman in the new movie is that he's pissed off with Superman because of what of what um, the what is the thing called the, the world, world engine the, the world engine did to the Indian Ocean. Yeah, Superman had nothing to do with that, and he killed the yeah. guy that I was know, responsible. But, <laughs> uh, by association, I guess, is because the Kryptonian. Yeah, I mean, because I always thought at the end of this movie, what would have been cool is if you know, as they panned over the. Um, and Clark was coming in, pan by one of the computer that says Lu- Luther Corp vows to help rebuild Metropolis or something, which mm-hmm. apparently is how Lex. Oh, in, nice. That yeah, but that apparently is how they're gonna what they're gonna work in with the new film, and you know that you know Bruce Wayne and I think Lex Luthor are, I think are both gonna be doing their job to help you know rebuild Metropolis. I have to say they did a really they didn't too, do too well. At portraying how much time had passed between any of the scenes, really, because you have a uh, you don't really have a good idea of how long he's been traveling across the uh, no. across the country or yeah. across the world, or how long Krypton had before it blew up. Because it looks like maybe a couple days had passed, maybe a month. Well, because even in the Donner film, you were, you were ten minutes on Krypton, but they had said explicitly thirty days had gone by. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, they they gave you a sense yeah. of time, and nonlinear storytelling can work. But I don't think it really worked here. Yeah, it was a little. It, they could kept. They needed to keep it tighter. Yeah, but they just yeah. kind of. They could have pieced together like some of the like or rearranged some of the scenes to give a a little better sense of timeline. So I have to give him credit for trying to tell uh. Tell Clark's upbringing, in a new way that we haven't seen. Yeah. By like having specific moments that he runs into, like bring his mind back to what had happened. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have done nonlinear, but uh, they, like you said, it needed to be tightened up a bit. You know, they mm-hmm. really needed to draw a little map, especially up. at the end. Like, you have him making out with Lois Lane <laughs> <laughs> in the uh, in Ground Zero. And then all of a sudden, he's just like back at the farm. He's like, "Mom, I figured out what I wanted to do." And he's walking into work almost. It seems like the next day. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I guess the Daily Planet was the only building that wasn't destroyed. And, uh... Yeah. And then that flashback where he's in the where he's in jeans and a t shirt and he puts the red cape up there, and, you know, as a kid striking the Superman pose. Part of me is like, was that literal or is that? Or because I'm just thinking about it now that you know, I was, there's you know, even I criticize that like. You know, who does this? But could that be like Clark? You know, because Martha said that your dad knows and we'd be proud of you. 
could that be him projecting that you no know, could that be not have ever really happened but in Clark's mind that was his projection of his dad you know finally seeing him come into his own when he really couldn't as an adult but maybe see it as a child why didn't they just use why, yeah, why didn't why they just use his actor <laughs> he was really a teen egg scene just have him running around <laughs> stuck, in the, stuck in the clotheslines like it could have been like five minutes before they took that fateful ride <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's fixing up the car and everything <laughs> come on Clark let's take it for a spin I saw you messing around with that cape out there. Don't you get any ideas? <laughs> you know my real dad. <laughs> dad, I believe I can fly. That's Shut up with that nonsense, boy. <laughs> you want to tell you about People flying? Can... <laughs> Think about it night and day. <laughs> People walk, Clark. How are you going to fit in? Start flying everywhere. <clears throat> By think, the way, like, I think uh, I have a hard time seeing like either of his fathers as good, good as a good influence. Like Jarrell basically forces him to become Superman. Yeah, ba- yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, yeah, and that's another thing. The ship had been there for like twenty thousand years or whatever. Yeah. Did like the computer? Then now that you put like um, the key sure. thing in there that rebooted, uh, you know. Um, Jarrell into the ship did it all of a sudden then materialize this um, uniform or was it like hey this was like you know Clark you know like Kalel. this uniform that. was your, this this um, red and blue outfit in here with the cape that was your great 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 yeah. great 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 <laughs> terraforming part of the family 20,000 years ago it was there so, so what <laughs> they I think, would want you to have it what I was thinking like maybe maybe it's like an ambassador's uniform Oh. Which is why it's like it's lacking in any of the armor and like why it was on that Genesis ship. But then that wouldn't explain why it has the fan, the, house, the House of L emblem, emblem on the uh, chest. True. Yeah. Although it, it'd be interesting that if they end up showing Supergirl on the screen and they had a flashback to her that she wakes up and she has her, uh, she'd have her own because she was part of that house, wasn't mm-hmm. she? Yeah. But she just had a female one. So maybe there was, there might have been a male one, but I, 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 it's much better to think that it materialized now. Yeah, they download the personality, which is pretty cool. The nano probes or whatever, you know. And what was with everybody on Krypton wearing gray and black? It was really drab place. Yeah. It was just like you know, it's like it's, it's, complete, just it's like, the complete opposite of the uh, white crystal toga spire. <laughs> yeah. The Smiths were born on Krypton and never left. Oh, man. I do like how uh, they had a lot of elements of the previous Superman movies, especially in this one. Like, you have, of course, like, Krypton, like, his beginning his beginning journey from, like, the first one. You have him fighting Zod, like, in the second one. Mm-hmm. You have him fighting against a machine. It's, like, adapting, <laughs> like to, adapting to his abilities in <laughs> like the third one. Did he punch a missile like the fourth one? <laughs> There's no uh, nuclear weapons in this one, but did he at least punch yeah. a missile? No, he punched the world ended, engine. Yeah. Well, then we can say a third slash fourth one at that. No fight on the moon, though. Oh, oh my God. Sweet. I was thinking about that. <laughs> didn't, like, carry the, didn't carry the American flag? No. <laughs> Well, no. Which make me think when they had, when Zod had the flashback, one of the one of the many expository flashbacks, um, when they showed them like searching the 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 other places where the Kryptonians uh, tried to terraform, where they're walking on the on the plant, you know, on the moon there, and you know, seeing all the dead, you know, people on the in the ships. I'm sitting here going. Yeah, I can kind of tell this is a green screen. And I immediately thought, like, you know, back to... Now that I had seen Superman 4, I thought back to Superman 4. I'm like, well, this is still better than that, but... I just can't get over that slow motion fight scene. No, just them on... Just them being on the moon and, like... Oh, it's Superman oh, yeah. 4. That's just... That was... It's just like and hilarious. Stalking up to him, just throwing slow-mo punches. Yeah, but I am going to say at least that was, like, 
you know, a lot less, a lot shorter. Because the mm-hmm. ending of this movie, the third act of this movie is exhausting. The fight scenes were amazing, though. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> oh, <laughs> this one. Yeah, once they started no, with the action, yeah. I, I like that it didn't really, didn't really stop. So but you never really, me, I guess. You never actually get to see Superman actually throw down and, I don't know, fight other, fight opponents like his his tier, and also see where his failings are as a uh, in self defense. I mean, he has some decent moves for somebody who's never fought in his life before. Yeah, seriously. <clears throat> He definitely, definitely must have does. got it from his dad. Because I don't think a scientist should be able to take out a general that easily. Yeah, like no. the, only, the only reason Zod won is because his detention was like <laughs> it's like watching the sun <laughs> fly off into the sky. Well, that's what the fight with uh, was Feyre, right? Mm-hmm. That that's what made me really like the character to enrich enrich her a lot. Now she put a beating on him for a while, <laughs> just using her skill and. You know, taunting him and everything like that, using all his weaknesses against him, because she could match up to him. Yeah, physically. I think she fucking. I think she throat chopped him at one point. And I like <laughs> she dragged him, like, <laughs> dragged his face to the streets and everything. You're right. I mean, I like Michael Shannon a lot, but she was actually much more of an effective villain. I mean, because he was just very stoic and pontificated, and she was just really good with the taunting and the, you know. She's the very, immediacy she, of the emotion. Well, she's very mm-hmm. pragmatic. Yeah. That's what makes a good villain. Yeah. Yeah, she's calculating and everything that, that made her even much better than what I was expecting. <clears throat> and honor. She had a lot of honor, too. Yeah. Especially when the colonel pulled out the knife, she's like, all right. Pulls out <laughs> hers. Yeah, she's great. I wish she would. I hope we see her again. In, in yeah, they didn't really, they didn't do yeah, too much explaining yeah. with the Phantom Zone. Like they never said where they, like well it'd be cool if they get sent to Apocalypse they accidentally said, yeah. or something and then they, she gets taken in as a uh, female fury yeah granny goodness granny goodness <laughs> oh, if only B. Arthur was alive <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess uh, move on to Dark Knight yeah I haven't talked much about that really just say I, I when I recently looked at the length the duration of the film I was uh, I think it clocked in a little over two two and a half hours right it's like yeah. 225 or something or maybe 235 and I there's not much I would think about cutting out I wasn't no. a big fan of Maggie Gyllenhaal but every scene carried a lot of weight you got a great range of emotion from all the characters and of course the actors yeah. were great to begin with it was just amazing the pacing the way everyone was just uh, just effective and, and uh, great references to you know Long Halloween that they draw a lot of inspiration from but they built it made it their own and even Killing Joke because Killing Joke gave an origin to the Joker in this movie he he the whole thing with the wife was very similar to Killing Joke yeah yeah. but he also had Plus the thing. way the way that he told that story too it was a little bit different than the other one than the others yeah and he goes uh, the first time he's like you know how I got these scars he tells about the father and then to Maggie Gyllenhaal know how he got these scars and he talks about how his wife you know got into this was a gam you know got into, with the sharks and and I think that's I think that was how he got into trouble in the killing joke wasn't it where um, his wife did something and he was doing something for to get her out of trouble when he fell into the acid it's been a couple of years since I've read it, and I apologize for killing joke. For killing yeah. joke yeah. yeah, I think so. So I mean, I for took sure. that as definitely a wink to the killing joke. But this this Joker is such a sociopath. For all you know, he did that to himself. I mean, I love the yeah. fact that yeah. he kept changing the story. So you have an origin, and then you still don't have the origin for him, which I thought was a really, really, really nice thing that they did on that part. So you got to have a past. He'd like it to be multiple choice. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, it it was a great theme because you know as soon as he starts telling that joke that or Joker story uh, origin to the scars, something menacing is going to happen. Like he was a he was a, he always had action planned in his head, and just I 
I try to pay close attention to him because he's obviously the best character in the film and all the movements are deliberate he was had great backup plans and he puts everyone in danger you know even at the at the risk of his own life which is a great way to be an ancient chaos yeah well Joker's actually got a death wish himself yeah he or just maybe I, he just doesn't he just doesn't want he doesn't want to push the button I'm pretty sure he wants Batman to do it that's the yeah. one thing that he that's his, the best way to, for him to go out as an, uh, what, not a, it's almost like a ritual suicide I guess for him yeah well that would also work because you know at the beginning one of the posse that you know when they're talking about the Joker that Joker set up this heist and Joker's actually one of the people in the heist he's like I where he wears makeup you know to scare people like war paint and then you've got the scar scarification and then you've got the whole you know what you were saying about the um, the death being a um, ceremony what, 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 you yeah, know, ritual, a, yeah. ritualistic I mean, that is that is kind of like the, in a lot of ways that he's very elemental in this. He's very, you know, I hate using the word tribal because it sounds so pretentious. Uh, there's a better way of saying that. But there, you know, he he does adopt a lot of things. You know, I don't know. It's all part of his persona and you know self emulation. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Oh wait, That's setting yourself setting on fire. fire. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, burning all that money. Pretty, pretty big way of uh, sending a message. Yeah. One of the great scenes in that film, um, when they're robbing the bank and um, the bank manager's coming out and he's shooting the um, shotgun, and the one guy goes to the Joker, he's like, he's out, right? And the Joker pauses for a minute and just nods. <laughs> and he goes up there and almost gets shot. And he goes, where'd you learn to count? And I'm like sitting here going, thinking, well, he was probably thinking, well, I can get rid of you. I can still get rid of the yeah. guy in the yeah. back. Um. But it's also like the little things like he did, like he does, like in the scene with um, uh, where he has the meeting with the other heads of the crime thing where he's like, you know, let's roll back the clocks a year. And after he, you know, basically, basically when, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Jai, Michael Jai White. Oh, jumped, in there, Gamble. Gamble jumps up and is like. And, and he goes dot 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 and he's got the grenade and he goes you think you can you know steal from us and get away with it and he's like yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> and your point <laughs> it's just you know it, it's just like the way he said that it's just I don't know just everything about him like you were mm. saying before so calculated just even the pencil trick was just uh, yeah. oh it'd be a joke <laughs> but just a huge intimidation factor and I I like the whole thing about escalation. Like they start at the end of um, Batman Begins, where he's just like escalation. You know, he's like you dressing up in a you know in a mask and cape, and he goes and you know there's a guy like you player for the theatric. You know, it's just like Batman brought this guy out. Yeah, and that's yeah. a that's a theme they promised in the last film. That they really delivered on in this film in a big big way. That the Joker said it. Um, uh, uh, Alfred said it, you know, that in, in this whole time, Bruce is trying to hold on to his ideals, you know, that, you know, he's going to be a symbol, that there's a way out of this. He's going to get Harvey Dent to, uh, you know, replace him. This, you know, his dreams are coming true. But the problem is it's too late. In saving the city, he already escalated to the point where he had the anti-Batman come out. Yeah. Like, the Joker couldn't really be the Joker without Batman, which is what the Joker then says to him mm -hmm. later on. <clears throat> yeah, and it's it becomes, I mean, it's a great a great way to introduce Dent because the he has two forces pulling on each end, whereas Batman even says this is the man that's going to replace me, and the Joker pulls him the other way, saying you're just one bad day away from being me, which in the essence we for all we know maybe not maybe true for the Joker or not, but still as a result you know with Batman sort of creating him, Batman himself was created. In I having one bad day. So, yeah, that's yeah, true. And at, at this point, I would say you can put them on each on one side of the coin, and Harvey Dent is the main focus of the story as to which which side he's going to land on. I mean, that is true. I mean, that actually is the plot, probably the plot of the movie. This is the fire motive with the it's with like the who, Joker too, because the Joker is responsible for burning half of his body. Yeah. 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 And the the one thing I. Th really found um, interesting about this is that 
the Joker won. Hmm. Any yeah. way, shape, and form, this movie ended. The Joker won because all he wanted, he two things he wanted. He wanted to, you know, Gotham soul. Let's just say he's like, you know, that that Harvey Dent was his ace in the hole in in the fight for Gotham soul, you know, and mm-hmm. and that Harvey Dent was, you know, the focal point. But also part of it was the Joker wanting Batman to become him. And he was killed after this catch twenty two. If after Harvey Dent died, if Batman told the truth, making himself look good, then the people the Joker would win because he turned Harvey Dent into himself. Yeah. But by taking the fall for it, even though Batman didn't commit the murders, everybody thinks he committed the murder and killed Harvey Dent mm-hmm. and therefore he became the Joker. So the Joker won regardless of what happened. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, Batman was put in a no-win situation. He really mm-hmm. was. And then it ended up being all for naught yeah. from the next movie. And, and yeah, that's something I kind of want to, I'm, I'm going to probably wait till we get to the Dark Knight Rises to get to because I, I, I main criticisms in the Dark Knight Rises are, oh my God, he gave up being Batman just because of Rachel? No. Let's examine that next film. But And I took some <laughs> notes on it. No. <laughs> But but the thing is, it's it's been there since Batman Begins. It's there through this film. It's just like he can't win. He can't help Gotham as Bruce Wayne, because as in the first movie, he goes, "I could be killed. I could be corrupted." But as a symbol, you know, and he wanted to be the symbol, and he gave birth to vigilantes who dressed up like him, who didn't really understand the fact that he was a symbol. You know, mm-hmm. they, they figured, okay, you know, I'm going to be, you know, copycat vigilante, you yeah. know. And ultimately, you know, in order to save Gotham, he had to tarnish that symbol. He had to replace this symbol with the symbol of the white knight, Harvey Dent. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, it's... He even got his own, uh, he even got his own town holiday. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if we're going to skip ahead to the next movie, with, you know, just briefly about the whole thing with the fusion reactor... Bruce Wayne finally finds a way to do something to to um, help the world as Bruce Wayne. And some scientist comes in and says, oh, by the way, I figured out how you can turn your unlimited power force into a weapon. So, I mean, this is like the history of Bruce Wayne is just like, you know, and I am jumping ahead because I had to finish that thought. But yeah. the, the whole thing about Bruce Wayne and, and Batman is that, you know, Batman is a symbol. He is a true believer in that. And that's why, you know, I think uh, um, Rachel Dawes says, you know, I can't, you know, I don't think there'll be a time when you don't need Batman. Because in a way, he does kind of hide behind him. That's where he gets his power. Yeah. And I, and I also think one other thing, I mean, because I have no problem with Chris, uh, Christian Bale's voice in this. I know a lot of he get, people get a lot of flack. And I, that doesn't bother me. But the one thing I, I do hear is just like, well, when he's alone with, you know, when he's alone with Fox or anything, he's, you know, he's just like, why is he talking to Fox, you know, or people who know him? It's like when he's in the cowl, no matter who he's with, he's Batman. Mm-hmm. He's like the ultimate yeah. method actor. Yeah. But when he was, when he's lamenting Rachel, he's in full bat suit, sitting on the chair, staring at the cow, talking to Alfred, and he's not in his bat voice. It's just like the cow itself is his alter ego. You know, as long as he has that on, he's Batman. Yeah. You know, and here he is, Bruce Wayne, looking at <clears throat> Batman, saying, "This isn't what I meant. This, you know, this I was supposed to be a symbol for good, not for death, not for destruction." I'm honestly surprised that he didn't just stick with the like his. I know a lot of it was to create a symbol that could live on beyond him, and to save Gotham. But a big chunk of why he wanted to give up the cowl was to be with Rachel and have a normal life and not have to deal with all that stuff. But I think she also said it well, where like, it's just like, don't let me be your one chance at a normal life. Mm. He really did put all of his eggs in the. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not 100% sure if, like, you know, all things being equal, if he had a normal life, if they ever would have been together, or if it's the fact that here's somebody who's known him his whole life who knows his identity, he doesn't have to pretend around, you know, maybe in his mind he put more into the romantic part than there actually was, you know. And I think she says it quite clearly 
you know, don't make me your one hope for a normal life. Yeah. Rachel. <laughs> 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 the other part, <laughs> my other favorite part, and I mean, because uh, as you know, I said before, th this to me was a, a pr one of the most perfect comic book movies. In that, you know, if you read like, if you read like Nightfall, and it's, you know, something like Nightfall, and it's total. You know, there's so much time about the villains and so many different things that you know don't involve Batman, and I think this movie Hint does that similarly. So you know, I know I'm going back to talking about the Joker, but I just want to say that I don't, I don't ever, th I don't. To me personally, the Joker doesn't over steal the show so much. But by the same token, he really is the comic relief of the film mm. because he's mm. sinister, and it's a really horrible scene when he do goes to see Harvey Dent where he's dressed as a nurse, but he goes and sits down and removes a mask and goes. Hi. Like he's like, oh, this is awkward. And then he's like, to himself, he goes, I don't want there to be heart feelings between us, Harvey. And he goes, when he he's basically saying, you know, and then he says, he's like, I just want you to know. And he's just like, so when you when I say that you and your girlfriend was nothing personal, personal, you know, I was telling the truth. It's just like you're a guy, you murdered the love of his life, and you're. It's just it's comedy. It is total gallows humor. It's yeah. like. And I'm yeah. a huge fan of Gallows yeah, Humor. I am yeah. too. It's so it's just like I don't think I don't think his character steals the show so much as he really you know he really is just he makes you laugh at things like in any from any other person you'd be like what like the bit with him blowing up a hospital. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that too. He has trouble with the. Uh... With the device, trigger, the yeah. trigger, yeah, and it's uh, for me. It's almost makes me think about Jack Nicholson, how he had his goons and how he'd paint over art. Uh, whereas this Joker kind of creates art through destruction, it, you know, it has fun with it while doing it. I mean, putting the guy, yeah. putting the grenade in the guy's yeah. mouth and <laughs> tying it to a thread <laughs> in his jacket. And there's no need for that. And it's, it's a smoke grenade. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's all theatrics, and it's but it works so great. <laughs> so many things that were good but, but I think like you said before I mean it is a two and a half hour movie and the pacing is absolutely perfect I don't you know it does it, it like I like all these I'm going to say you know like all these Nolan movies they feel like they're three movies put into one they have very distinct different acts they have you know they do give you enough time with the villains and enough time with Batman and Bruce Wayne and all, you know, they give you, they somehow cram all this stuff in there, pace it out right, and give you so much information without bogging everybody down in exposition. Which I think is, uh, I think we can all agree, uh, Man of Steel had a bit of trouble with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when in doubt. When in doubt, go to one. Go to the holographic projector to, yeah, lens flare. More lens yeah, flare. lens flare. More li lens flare. It's like yeah. lens, lens flare. There was so much lens flare in that just to make or distract the audience from the fact that nothing was adding up the way it should have. Yeah, back to the pacing of the Dark Knight. It's it was very refreshing to see how all the words you know gave characters uh, depth. Even the the minor ones that had one or two lines, Gotham, very similar to the Donner, uh, Metropolis, had life, and it it, it became it was uh, a anthropomorphic anthropomorphized, if you will, or personified, because the fairy scene was very powerful with the prisoners and mm -hmm. getting rid of the triggers, mm -hmm. uh, not killing each other. Who knew Debo had a heart? Yeah. And it shows it. It told a really good story because that's what the story hinged on, at least for for Joker and for Batman, to see the good in people and not not for everyone to have a bad day. But all it took was one person to be one. Yeah, and that's and that's it. The you had the one inmate who's just like you know, 
basically like, you know, if anybody's going to survive, it shouldn't be us. And he threw the thing out. And the funny thing is that Warden's going to lose his fucking job the next day. <laughs> you give the detonator to who? You're out of here. But he gave an impassioned speech. <laughs> <laughs> If your five year old came up to you and gave you an impassioned speech, and it, but then you got the the people, this innocent, sweet and innocent civilians, and you know when it came down to it, the guy, they're, none con- of, they're convicts. Yeah, the killer, the quote unquote killers, couldn't kill in that magnitude, and the people who thought they could kill because of it, the ones who were passing judgment couldn't do it. So like you know, and because that's kind of the tragedy of the movie is that Batman slash Bruce Wayne is right. He was a symbol that things are better, but the tragedy is it's going to cost that symbol that brought everything mm-hmm. together. You know, his symbol. That's the that's going to be the cost of um, you know uh, Gotham's safety. It's not the hero they want. <laughs> <laughs> the hero they need. Oh my god, that is like the best. That's one of my favorite lines in the movie. It's like, you know, why is he running, Dad? Because we have to chase him. I'm like, I, this is, I mean, that says so much. It's just, that's just great. Yeah, top to bottom, that movie, the, the Dark Knight is just poetry in motion. I mean, even the action scenes, we were talking about action scenes. The Dark Knight action scenes, no action scenes la- last more than it should. I mean, to me, there's nothing more boring than car chases. So unless you're somebody like, you know, Nolan or George Miller or something like that, you know, to pull off a good car chase, to make it interesting and not overdo it, it's really, really difficult. Plus, I have him use so many of his gadgets, but have them be for a purpose within the story. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the slaughter is the best medicine. <laughs> Yeah, it was like five times that it took me to see that movie until I re- realized that, like, you know, the laughter is the best medicine you drew the S on. I'm like, oh my God, I never even know. It took me, like, it wasn't until, like, you know, because I've seen this movie, like, Batman Begins. I've seen them both, like, if, if I, 30 times might be a, a low estimate. Yeah, those sequences are really good. Especially when they, he goes to uh, Hong Kong and gets loud. Yeah. Like, that was it's perfect. Just that the way he was able to extradite him with that, it was just jaw dropping. Everybody's sitting there like, okay. <laughs> That's no we know we can do. <laughs> Not prepared for that. She's grappling onto a plane. <laughs> <laughs> and the jerker is right. Batman has no jurisdiction. Yeah. yeah. He's gonna make him you know I know the squealers and <laughs> it's like Behind the scenes, it was really funny because I'm, uh, I'm kind of afraid of heights. Like I'm, re- I really hate being in buildings, tall buildings. I don't trust planes. I'm okay with. I just don't like the claustrophobic aspect, and you know anything like mountains or so forth. You know, as long as I'm a few feet away, you know away from the edge, I'm fine. And like I'm sitting, like that whole thing when he goes to get loud and he's at the edge of the building always makes my toes curl, and I'm like thinking, well, at least that's a green screen. Well, come to find out, no, they were on top of that. Mm. Christian Bale had little wires there. I'm like, wow, Bale and Nolan just don't give a shit about heights. I would be like, no. <laughs> yeah, with him standing on top of the gargoyles. <laughs> How much are you paying for me for this? No. <laughs> yeah, he'd stand up there for a second and be like, all right, we got it. Let's <laughs> <laughs> keep looping it. <laughs> yeah, take a three, we're going to use this 360 camera. <laughs> <laughs> Take a panic shot. We'll uh, get LIM to put in the sun. <laughs> Batman's going to Hong Kong. Wait, that was, I didn't even read that one, but there was a Batman Hong Kong, wasn't there? A what? There was a Batman comic where he was in Hong Kong or something, wasn't there? Probably. There was one where he was in Tokyo, too. Oh, was it Tokyo? I thought it was in Hong Kong. No, he's been everywhere. All right, well, yeah. <laughs> he has no jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> Who says a case can't also be a vacation? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. First Bruce Wayne, then Batman at my spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what are the chances? Lucky day. 
Yeah, and I like how he's just like, he scones with the entire Russian ballet, but all of a sudden, Bushman disappears from this boat. You know, I guess none of the Russians never said, hey, Bruce Wayne disappeared from boat. We weren't too far from Hong Kong. That's where Batman went. It's like he came back with he came back with a squirming bag. <laughs> <laughs> he had to keep kicking it to stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Alfred, take care of yes, Master Bruce. <laughs> Just add human trafficking to the unless the laws is broken. Well, <laughs> Don't crash into national waters with someone. But that the kind of, you know, it's not out of Alfred's wheelhouse because he said, yeah. you know, long time ago, some friends and I were in Burma. Yeah. Helping the local governments. It's just like, what the fuck are you, what? How do you get a job like that? How do you become a butler afterwards? Maybe the, maybe him becoming a butler is like his penance, like the shit that he used to do. Seriously. Burn a forest and just catch one guy. Or maybe he met, you know, Thomas Wayne in Doctors Without Borders, and Thomas Wayne got him. Mm, you know, it's just like, hey, what are you doing out here? I don't know. I'm helping the local governments. Want to come and be my valet? Okay. Master Wayne. <laughs> I like the sound of that. <laughs> Rolls off the tongue. He does have to be about the same age if he was still alive, right? Yeah, yeah maybe. Uh, maybe he's a he was a, yeah, that's true. He might be a little older, but not a not lot older. Yeah. And it, and I like that. I like the fact that, like, you know, as we said before in the other films, like, Alfred is always the best part of, you know, yeah. those early films. And, and I, I, I like how their his competency is his understanding of the world. There's actual reason for it. There's a backstory to Alfred you don't know about. Yeah. Mm. Like astronomy is Michael Go was. It's just like, well, how did you build the fat cave and the armor and all that? You know, how do you do all the things you do? And <laughs> vacuum and answer the door for trick or treaters. And in this one, you. How do you, you run an entire mansion by yourself? Exactly. And, and, you know, in this one, you know, in this one, it's just like, you know, Albert's got this sordid past. You know. Like, you got a hint of uh, Gordon's as well, especially with him joining the SWAT crew. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. All right. I thought you were talking to Alfred and Gordon. Yeah. That, yeah. You knew, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all of them had, had a, had a yeah, reference to their backstory. Even Dent with Gordon, they kind of, they didn't know each other, but they knew the names. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even Dent had a Harvey Two-Face nickname down over in uh, his precinct. They never really explained that nickname. Yeah. Because so, he didn't really... I guess because he's a DA, he reports on, on like police behavior and everything. Like, well, he was he works him. for Internal Affairs, uh, so which means basically he's your friend of the cop, but he's also keeping an eye on you. He's yeah. he's basically smiling on one hand, but you know, and trying to be your friend on one hand, but is also like you know, sizing you down for suspicion. Like in other words, you know, you can't trust this guy because he's always you know he's doing like everything. Yeah, yeah, he may come with you with a smile, but really he's you know, he's trying to size you up. Go out for a drink. Wake up the next day to find out you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a great Fucking way. Harvey Dent. That's a great way to show how, like how effective his character was in that in their world as a lawyer and taking down that guy that you know put a gun to his face. Mm -hmm. Like he could hold his own, and he ended up being completely right about the dirty cops. Like he, we, they did not hide that, or you know fool, try to fool the audience. It was just that it was Gordon. To, to, Continuously saying that they were not dirty, and that's what did him in. So, hey, Gordon, guess who's the one that took Rachel? Guess R Ramirez. Yeah, <laughs> say it louder, louder. <laughs> yep. Speak. You had to speak louder into my good ear because this one's burned off. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but that's the interesting thing about this is because you know, and Gordon says, if I um, was if I didn't have any cops you know, that weren't investigated at some point, I'd be working alone. So he's right. He couldn't be an idealist. He's got to be a pragmatist. But also, mm -hmm. by the same token, Harvey Dent's right, because if he's investigating in this cops, there's a good portion of, you know, Gordon's crew that's going to be shifty, as we've seen. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, is capable of that. And that's what makes it interesting is 
it as with Batman and, and the Joker, everybody's right and everybody's wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there. I love the amount of gray areas in this movie. Yeah, like it shows that it's, the world isn't black and white. No. And he just like Bruce just everyone kind of steps away from this, just not being able to not really knowing like where to stand anymore. And I gotta remember to say this when we get to the next film. But I mean, this that experience at the end broke so many people. It broke Gordon. It broke uh, Bruce. And by extension, it broke Alfred. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's just th- this almost. Whole... It almost broke Lucius. Yeah. Because yeah. like if he because if he'd kept the uh, sonar thing going, like Lucius would have just like oh, given up yeah. on everything. Oh my god, that was that's awesome. Where he's just like, you just know, just type in your name when you leave. And that whole ending montage where he's just like, you know, people deserve to have their faith rewarded, and that's where a fox types in this thing and things mm-hmm. explode. So yeah, you're right. The what could have Lucius was almost broken, but yeah, it tested every single character's you know, ethic choosing right and wrong and if you choose a vigilante route how how deep down, down that rabbit hole do you want to go yeah it's like he says I see now what I'd have to become to stop men like him you know he you know he he threw um in, in the last movie he takes um or what's his name the the guy that was uh the the flop the guy who took the money oh, yeah. oh yeah um Gordon's partner yeah he hoists him up and says tell me where the drugs are you know and then lets him down easy you know and he doesn't hurt him and this time he takes Maroni and drops him off the thing it's just like yeah. this he actually not kill me. Tort- counting on it yeah he actually tortures somebody he doesn't just you know scare him and then let him that's, down that's the Batman I remember yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's just like he is starting to become that because he has to because none of these none of these guys are going to respond anymore it, but the Joker's pushed him there, and mm-hmm. he was the catalyst for that. Yeah, he, it's funny. I mean, he just keeps hitting Joker, and he's just like, it doesn't matter. You had nothing on me. Yeah. And you can't threaten him. You have nothing to do with all your strength. Go ahead, kill me. Die. Yeah, I dare you. Punch me, do it. beat me, kill me. Please, please, please. I want you to do it. I want you to do it. I want you to do it. Hit me. <laughs> I just, uh, just from, uh, what a great, everything about this movie is just fantastic. Mm-hmm. You know, getting back to the music, you know, James Newton Howard and, and Hans Zimmer, you know, fucking delivered as all hell. Um, you know, Jonathan and Christopher Nolan's dialogue was phenomenal. Mm. All the acting was good. And I agree with you. I'm not a huge fan of Maggie Gyllenhaal. And I think Rachel should have I, I I think somewhere between Katie Holmes and Maggie Gyllenhaal is Rachel. I was thinking that <laughs> speaking yeah. of Rachel's, I was thinking that like Rachel Weiss, if you know, a couple of years <clears throat> like early in her career when she was like say yeah. if she was in, you know, earlier in her year, she would have been a good Rachel Dawes. Yeah, that's what was that, two thousand eight? Yeah, it was two thousand eight. Yeah, eight years ago. Like Rachel Weiss when she was in the mummy like in ninety nine. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, it's I think they were setting her, setting up her character for this specific, that specific reason that the killer, and that yeah. have it, have it, carry weight and fully affect, you know, Batman and Bruce. Which is why they should have just kept Katie Holmes. <laughs> they were just gonna kill her off in the next movie. Well, she was. Um, I think there were scheduling reasons or something yeah. that she couldn't do it, or maybe she's pregnant or something. I don't remember. But Katie, she's, she was in a bit. She's locked up out of Scientology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she's planning her escape. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just like picturing the Batman music playing. She's just like running through the halls of her mansion, <laughs> collecting her daughter and things, and trying to get out of dear life. The 
<laughs> the bat pod carrot crashes through the <laughs> Dude, that was an, uh, there's a here's a side <laughs> Tom Cruise all done up in Joker makeup. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going, Katie? <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys ever? I was in California for four months, about fifteen, sixteen years ago, and um, the uh, the this, the main Scientology building, you know, in Hollywood on like L. Ron Hubbard Boulevard or whatever it is, hmm. it totally, totally, you know, it, it was, it's very, it's like a very, it's a big structure. It's you know, it could definitely be like you know the Hall of Justice or what was it, you know, from Super Friends? What was yeah, the village? Yeah. It was the Hall of Justice. Oh, no, the. The Legion, or, the Legion, it. it was all uh, something of doom. The Legion of Doom. I know it could, I could. So I'm. What I'm saying is, like, now that I pictured that with like the, the had this globe or something spinning in front of it with the little, <laughs> I could totally see that now <laughs> with like Katie coming up to this thing. <laughs> oh, that was a nice little <laughs> diversion <Yeah>. to Scientology. <laughs> oh man, oh, we don't want to bash them too hard. Well. They'll come. They're gonna sue us. Yeah, they'll sue us. Shut down. Yep. Wait for the last round. (laughs) Scientology wins. (laughs) (laughs) I joined this new cult. It's it's the bees knees. You all have to join. You all have to join. (laughs) So we renamed this the countdown to (laughs) (laughs) the countdown to uh, lawsuit. But yeah. uh, uh, I mean, Rachel Dawes was kind of, is kind of like a, a you know, it's kind of like a fall. You know, you, I agree with you. I think they set her up. They don't know exactly how they're going to do it, but they're like, you know, they're going to need a disposable character who is kind of like, yeah. you know, she kind of gets sanctimonious, which kind of, you know, yeah, she, she talks way too much shit about uh, I don't know, every, every, it seemed like every other conversation that she had with Bruce was just her taking him down a peg. Yeah. Despite all he, all, despite all he sacrificed to help make the city better, and she's always like providing mixed messages with him. Mm. Yeah, she was very cavalier about a lot of things too. When she didn't bat an eye when Harvey had a gun pointing at him, and as they're walking out, she's she kind of glosses over it, doesn't really pay much attention. She's, and at one point, she's like, "You know, I'm I'm, I'm fine. Okay, you know, by the way, if you were worried about me, like I'm I'm okay emotionally. <laughs> I didn't just have a gun pointed at me at my chest." You got them as DA. If you're not, if people aren't trying to kill you, you're not doing your job right. Yeah. And also, just kind of thinking, no, I know I'm going to get saved, but I just want you to know, Harvey, like, I love you, and, you know, but sorry that you're not going to get saved. I'm going to get yeah, saved. Yeah, she told, <laughs> yeah, she, 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 told you know. me, she totally thought that she was going to be the one that gets saved for Bruce, and that he was going to blow up, and it wasn't until he she heard him over the, fo- over the uh, intercom saying, no. No, you should have went for her. Which is just like, oh shit. <laughs> but I'm not trying to get at her or anything. I'm not trying to do anything. That's awesome because I hadn't thought about that. Like, yes, they really, you know, she really did believe, which kind of more explains to her the whole resignation. Like, I'm gonna die. Okay, it's okay. It's just like, you know, credit to Maggie Gyllenhaal. She pulled that off. Like, yeah. you know, she went right from, you know, I do want to spend, you know, my life with you. You know, thinking that she is gonna be saved, and then you hear, no, why are you coming for me? And she's like. Okay, okay, it's just like the flip. The I wonder if she survived, would she have taken that letter back from uh, Alfred? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, hey, can I? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, don't need it much anymore. <laughs> you son of a bitch. You weren't going to come after me, is that what you If only you had thought to save Harvey first. And that's... That was the other thing is because it's just like I was wondering if they were like equidistance. I mean, it was just, or well, then again, you know, was Batman in the Bat Pod at that point? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's in the Bat, he was in the Bat Pod, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you know, he could have gotten wherever he needed to go quicker, and I think the Joker probably knew that too. Like well, I think just... I thought he just tricked him and he was just choosing Harvey. Well, yeah, he did. Killing Harvey would be yeah, killing Harvey would definitely not it would not have worked at all in the grand the grand scheme of things. No, he didn't. He didn't. But I was also, I mean, he definitely did trick him to go save Harvey, but he also knew that, you know, if he was going to f- jump out the window for Rachel, and given that yeah. he's Batman and above the law, you mm. know, outside the law, yeah. rather, uh, outside the law, 
that whatever happened, he was going to get to whichever destination first. Uh, this is a fucking perfect movie, in my opinion. Yeah. It is an absolute perfect movie. Yeah, there's so many things I can think about that just keeps reinforcing the argument that it's a quality movie, film, just all around, because it does so many good things that every everyone should do. You know, telling stories or building an air, like a world around it without dialogue, which is action, and just showing what's what's occurring around in the world mm-hmm. without you know, have throwing it in your face. montages or the sequences and everything were awesome and then one thing I really loved was the fact that because because in the other films it seemed like you know well except until we got to um, Batman and Robin it seems like they killed well they didn't kill on Batwoman or Catwoman but you know it seemed like they killed a lot of villains in the other yeah, or Batman very refreshing yeah. to see in and any superhero movie really Falcone didn't die you know <laughs> Rosal Gould died and then Scarecrow didn't die. Scarecrow comes yeah. back for all three films, which I thought was neat. In that, you know, it provided some continuity. I mean, for all you know, Zaz is out there running the streets because, you know, he was sent to Arkham and Batman Begins. So, yeah. you know, it, it just lends the, it, it keeps the door open for that. There is this whole life in within Gotham, you know, that, you know, not every <clears throat> bad guy is killed. Harvey Dent died in this one, but, you know, let's face it, and the, if we're going to move this into the real world, him walking around with his face like that, it, you know, half burned off the way it is, you know, he would have died of shock amongst other things, you know, yeah, he would have never have gotten up. What was he? He wasn't even taking painkillers at that point. No. Yeah. So, e- even if he had lived that long, he wasn't going to live another day or two. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, the car crash. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Just yeah, he's put to the ringer. <laughs> I survived the chemical explosion. <laughs> no way this limo is going to take me out. So I'm going to survive this fall too, snap. <laughs> the Batman used his body to cushion the fall too. <laughs> You're a dead man anyway, Harvey. <laughs> We've only got two days left to live. I've got the rest of my life. He uses a little, the, the little, the little cameras or whatever they he had for the night vision. He's like, Harvey, I see that you've got, uh, you know, staff. You've got a staff infection. You're not living long anyway. <laughs> By the way, Rachel's gonna leave you for me. <laughs> <laughs> really, really turn the knife. Wound is fresh. <laughs> They're on the ground. The conversation you didn't hear while well, Gordon is suddenly running down. Harvey, you are uh, my last breath. Okay, Rachel is going to leave you for me. And I'm Bruce Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been belittling you all movie. You're good, good talk. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been a real gut punch to get that letter. I'm for telling about that letter. All that shit he talked to Harvey on the way down. Yeah, Brings back to reality. You did what? I told Harvey <laughs> his dying breath. <laughs> I don't care what Rachel said. To you. <laughs> Good talk. <laughs> <laughs> Why is he running, Dad? <laughs> hey, Harvey, you're masking my brother. <laughs> the bond that must never be broken. <laughs> what? The bond that must never be broken. <laughs> so, anybody come to a decision? About what? Oh, is there anything else you guys want to add? Oh, uh, we might. I mean, I could talk about We'd this We'd be at this all night, yeah. Uh, I, was say, <laughs> I could talk about this movie for another four or five hours, but, you know. I mean, because there's just actually, in this movie, there is so much you can talk about this movie in, yeah. in every angle, and I think we've tried to attract, attack it from every angle, but, you know, each one of these subjects we've glossed over, essentially, 
could be a whole podcast in and of itself, to be honest with you. <laughs> tune, tune in for the next rounds of Countdown to Justice. The Dark Knight. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how we rewrite bad movies? We'll rewrite this one as a comedy. <laughs> And we'll episode the, ten. Of we'll give the this Dark one Knight. the we'll give this one the Schumacher treatment. <laughs> <laughs> Harvey, I needed a partner. <laughs> need a partner. I didn't need just a friend. I needed a partner. You've got one. <laughs> Gordon's just like, and I'm here too. <laughs> Who are we doing here again? <laughs> Who's in charge? <laughs> Harvey. There's a C now, Gordon. <laughs> Albert just like, oh, just, just fucking revolving door of people in the back here. <laughs> selling tickets. Well, in this one is, you know, the, there is no, there's only that thing under. Oh, yeah. So it's like Alfred's taking people to the shipping yard, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Get your Batman tickets. No, seriously, seriously, come inside this 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 uh, storage container. Don't worry about it. There's nothing to throw. I kind of I kinda wanted to see like a growing like group of people just like happen to see Alfred walk into the shipping container <laughs> and just dis- <laughs> every morning with yeah, coffee and like disappear for a couple hours, or maybe see like Bruce Wayne pop out with his with his uh <laughs> motorcycle. <laughs> It's like, what is going, what, are they just like standing around in a shipping container, <laughs> shooting the shit? Is he working on his bike? <laughs> yeah. Is that Bruce Wayne? It's, it's like every once in a while, like every once in a while, they'll cut back and just see somebody like, <laughs> I swear, I saw a motorcycle come out of here. I saw a Lamborghini coming out of here. <laughs> So Batman, leave this. <laughs> Batman, leave this goddamn container. <laughs> this, old, this old British yeah, butler walked in. Yeah, so I think, I think, I think Batman's an old, old British man. Always <laughs> <laughs> see Alfred go in and then come out. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see we get definitely this has got comedy potential potential I'm just like you know I'm still stuck in that hole <laughs> Harvey Harvey I want you to know I took Rachel's virginity <laughs> she's my first love and your last <laughs> <laughs> your last <laughs> what's that that's oh, great <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Wayne's a dick. <laughs> and definitely set off with the good talk. Yeah. Harvey takes his last breath. Good talk. <laughs> Way to contribute to the conversation. Hold on, I got this. Just flips a coin. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? You're dead. <laughs> I was gonna, I'll be great if they did a call back to uh, Batman Forever. And while he's flipping the coin for Gordon's son's life, just throw a bunch of coins at him. <laughs> <laughs> Catch! <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. We have to really work on that mashup. <laughs> I would love to see a Tommy Lee Jones, uh, Two Face, and uh, uh, what's his name? Aaron Eckhart's. Uh, yeah, Two Face and one innocent in the movie. <laughs> Be the odd couple. <laughs> I'm, I'm sad that Michael Goat is no longer with us because I'd really like to see the I really like to see the two Alfreds call a buddy co- have a buddy copy. Yeah, it seems like Michael Caine's Alfred would be the uh, 
he'd be the one that did most of the like leg work <laughs> and got like Michael Goes Alfred that's just like the cue yeah he's <laughs> <laughs> like making him all of his gadgets <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you must do more with this cave. You must do more with this cave. I wouldn't eat that fruit if I were you, Alfred. You might get sick in your mm -hmm. bed. <laughs> I got two jokers on screen would be cool. Huh? Two jokers on screen would be cool, too. Mm. Yeah, we had a lot of uh, first repetition in the villains, pretty much. Yeah. Oh, well, Alexa, wow. of course, like. That's, that was a constant in most of the Superman films, but two itinerations of Zod, two versions of Joker, and uh, two versions of Dent that we've seen. Hey, you know, I, I'm going to say when it comes to Zod, I, I, I think Michael Shannon and um, Terrence Stamp. Terrence Stamp both did a really good job. I yeah. don't think there was, with the Batman villains, it's definitely going, I'm definitely going to be that, yeah, Ledger's is the, Ledger and Mark Hamill are my Jokers. You know, I mm. don't like, I really don't like, um, <clears throat> Jack Nicholson, um, and but but I'm gonna say with Superman though, like the Zods, they both did really, you know, both they each brought something different to the table. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Michael Shannon's was like he was a moving character, and like he very, like made he, it very clear what it, like his, his convictions were, and, yeah. and you, could, you could relate to them too. Yeah, he's literally he, he, he <clears throat> tells everyone you know his or tells Superman like his purpose and. After having a rock, he just goes on a rampage. He unleashes all like the fury that was kind of contained within. And once he has nothing, nothing to lose, he kind of just goes off. I just love that moment of him learning how to fly, or just figuring out how to fly within yeah seconds. Well, the thing that was also interesting about the two Zods was the fact that Terrence Stamp is not a big guy, mm. and Michael Shannon. I don't know in real life how tall he is. I guess he's six foot, but you know he was very tall and imposing. And Terrence Stamp wasn't tall and imposing. I mean, yeah, we had the early, late 70s, early 80s, you know, fairly shoestring budget costuming or whatever. <clears throat> but the, both actors did a lot, took <clears throat> took a great spin on that role. Mm -hmm. You know, Zod didn't need to be this physically um, commanding presence, but he could also be this physically physically commanding presence. I mean, there are two sides. Both actors played Zod very, very well. Yeah. yeah. Well, all right. I guess uh, if we want to vote, wind it down and uh, wrap it up, rather. And remember, we're going to tally all these votes later, so audience, we don't all have to agree. I just wanted to put that out there because I'm really interested in hearing this one. <clears throat> I wanted to try so hard to be devil's advocate for Man of Steel because I do love it. It's one of the better Superman movies we've seen. I mean, the Donner cuts and Superman 2 were really, really well. Uh, even though the second one kind of started veering off because there was a change in the the direction of the film. Uh, this one, though, I, I really did enjoy Zack Snyder and I wanted to make a good case, but Dark Knight after rewatching it and not having seen it in maybe a couple of years though now I I can't not vote <coughs> for Dark Knight it just fired all cylinders and Man of Steel tried to keep up but it was always just falling short to everything true like I like I think I yeah, I just I wanted to watch Man of Steel again to see if there was anything I could get out, or anything more I could get out of it, see if it could pull ahead. But just, it's like with the pacing issues, the lack of like lack of strong character development for anybody but Clark and Jarrell <clears throat> and Zod, basically. Yeah, once again, Lara gets screwed over. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> a lot girl, of girl, girl and bus. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I'm gonna have to give this one to the Dark Knight. Super Man of Steel is a real divisive movie. Uh, people either mm -hmm. really like it or love it, as you guys, or people really hate the movie. And um, I don't hate the movie. I don't think it's a horrible movie. It's got its flaws. Um, 
and there's definitely mm -hmm. things we do different. And the third act really needed some trimming. But I don't hate Dark Knight. Or sorry, I don't hate Man of Steel. It's not. I'm not gonna say it's, sit here and be it's a bad movie. With that said, <laughs> as if I haven't made clear, I've the Dark Knight is one of my absolute favorite movies, so it's getting my vote. I just want to make that clear because I know there's, I know it kind of came in here expecting actually to like Man of Steel less than I did, and I actually ended up seeing more good in it than I had thought. Uh, so Superman started off right out the gate with a couple wins. Now Batman's just like it's a little engine that could. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's you know, it's not totally Superman's fault. I mean, really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brian Singer really fucked that one over. Yeah, and Chris Nolan knew exactly what to do, and he did it right. Put it out there, and we're just along for the ride. Man. And one thing he did do is he treated every movie like there wasn't going to be a sequel. Like he mm -hmm. was yeah. teased the next movie, but he wanted to make a complete movie. So that if there wasn't one, you'd have a complete movie. True, you didn't even need one after Begins. No. There was just enough to have the Joker card flip yeah. over. Just to show there's a continuation. That's what I, I mean, that's what I found a little pretty good with Man of Steel. They didn't have to leave on a cliffhanger. This started the the new timeline. It uh, Or I guess started a continuous timeline. Uh, just the way that Iron Man started, I guess Marvel. Uh, for it to be continuous. And it doesn't hint or try to leave in a cliffhanger at all just that you know this is the world that they build around it yeah Clark Kent's at the Daily Planet now and that's it the next films will take place in that universe and that's I, I kind of like that I mean we're we're I think we're a little spoiled with what Marvel does you know giving little end of credit scenes and everything like that it was interesting that a comic movie didn't do that for once in yeah. a while yeah <clears throat> and I hope uh, and I hope they don't I hope that they don't I hope DC stays away from that yeah, yeah. I hope they really if they're gonna do this I really f hope that they try to do bring their own spin to it I really do that's what we all agree Dark yeah. Knight takes Dark the Knight. win and we'll tally this up at the end, though. But uh, I guess that's it for now for the show. This is, or this was Countdown to Justice Round 6. My name's Luis Duran. My name's Rich Perry. And I am Chris Morgan. Have a good night. Thanks for joining us. Good talk. <laughs> Music and editing by Chris Morgan. This has been a Lost Signals production. All rights reserved. <laughs>